So, uh, good morning, everyone. I think we'll start now. I'm receiving WhatsApp messages of people who are late, but uh, let's let's be on time. So, uh, welcome to this open forum on capacity building for civil servants on digital transformation, which is uh, co-organized by UNESCO and GIZ's Fair Forward team. Uh, some of our GIZ colleagues are also online. Uh, and welcome to all of you who've made it uh, this early in the morning. This is, uh, the idea is really to, to have an open conversation, to learn from you. We've shared with you some of the guiding questions on what this open forum seeks to achieve. Uh, the first idea is to really convene a diverse group of experts uh, from different parts of the world who are working on capacity building initiatives so that we can explore whether a coalition would be a sustainable model to go forward uh, in terms of sharing good practices uh, of capacity building initiatives. I've been here since the past two, three days and we've heard about so many wonderful initiatives, but they don't seem to be talking to each other. For instance, I was talking to Mark from Kenya and uh, in GIZ and they're working, they're doing some great work. And then I was talking to uh, Risper, who's also here from uh, Nairobi, and they're doing some great work, but th we need to kind of learn from this work and then also share these practices with different parts of the world. So there's just, this is just one of the reasons. The second is, of course, uh, we want to also develop new content and create new knowledge products, which can then be used by partners and organizations in different around the world. So just as an example, we launched the competency framework on AI and digital transformation with the UN Broadband Commission, which is itself a multi-stakeholder group composed of the private sector, civil society, governments, uh, academia, and UN entities, of course. And uh, we developed this framework in a, through an year-long process of regional consultations and then through a working group. And now we have the framework, which has identified a wide range of competencies, and uh, some of you have the copies in front. Now the point is about how to operationalize this, and UNESCO alone cannot do it, or GIZ alone cannot do it. We need to work with partners and build these coalitions. And then eventually support governments with your expertise. So this is the kind of the broad uh, theme of the conversation today. I'll invite our uh, technical team to play two short videos to kind of set the stage, and then my role will be really to facilitate conversation. We'll be taking notes, and, uh, and then I'll walk you through some of the, the final objectives for the session. Uh, may I request the host to play the video, please? Artificial intelligence and digital transformation competencies for civil servants. We stand on the cusp of a digital revolution brought by artificial intelligence and other digital technologies. These technologies are shaping societies and economies and are predicted to add over $13 trillion to the global economy by 2030. Given how significantly AI and digital transformation is affecting different social groups in our environment, policymaking plays a crucial role in ensuring sustainable development. The question is, are civil servants ready? Unfortunately, the answer is no. A recent survey of 198 countries found 47% had no strategy to improve digital skills. And 51% of government chief information officers said they were blocked from implementing digital transformation schemes by siloed strategies and decision-making. This needs to change. And UNESCO has been working on how. Beyond funding constraints, there are three key challenges to address. Cultural and organizational barriers. Many governments see opportunities in changing their traditional way of working by encouraging experimentation and innovation to deliver better services to people. Data and infrastructure barriers. This includes limited access to data sets, inefficient data organization, management and governance, and a lack of IT infrastructure investment. These issues need to be addressed. Human resource capacity. 
related competency gaps grow when there are low levels of investment in digital adaptation, data analysis, IT, and AI skills, particularly for women. The adoption of digital technology and digital systems needs to be inclusive and fit each organization's unique context. Fortunately, while these issues might be challenging, they aren't impossible to address. Watch the next episode to learn more about it. So that's a, that's a short overview of the challenges that uh, we've mapped over the past years. And I would, before we go to some of the solutions that we are proposing, actually like to open the floor and invite um, our host uh, country here, Mr. Uh, Nobu Nishigata, to also say some opening remarks and welcoming words. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Kyoto on behalf of the Japanese government and the Ministry of the Internal Affairs and Communication who hosts this IGF. We are very much proud of it, and a uh, warm welcome to everybody. And just I saw the video, that's great work. Uh, most of them I agree, uh, even in the Japanese government. And uh, we always appreciate the work of the UNESCO, the wide range of the work stream on uh, the, cap the, the capacity building. And uh, let me give some words on the, the capacity building that the Japanese government is facing. Just uh, some of the problems that uh, you already showed. And uh, for example, like we are having a hard time to connecting with Zoom. It's more like a network thing. Like uh, we can use the WebEx and uh, Teams but uh, some different network structure provided by the Zoom, so we are still working on it. And of course, the, the company with Zoom is also working to, to get us more like connectivity to the Japanese government so that we can use them, for particularly for the webinars, you know. I mean, for the video conference, then the WebEx and Teams are okay, but once we want to have the, the webinars, then, then the Zoom is some advantage right now, so we are working on that thing. Or maybe like uh, some challenges in the government is more like a procurement, I would say. It's a big issue, like uh, for the government perspective, I mean, there are a bunch of the different kind of the people working in areas. So for example, the people who are working on the research and development side, and then we don't much worry about the, their capacity or capability of the doing their job because they know what the technology is and uh, they know how to cope with it. But on the other hand, the, the normal people who usually, you know, the making the documents are like for me, like make some documents to the minister, documents to the other ministries and some speech for the minister, etc. These people, we are not very good at a computer. I mean, of course, we can use the computers, but we do, We know more. We want to know more about the, the, what the technology is built on and those kind of things. Once, particularly when it comes to the AI, like a chat GPT is a great solution, and we have very big uh, expectation on the technology within our work. But still, there are some risks in it. And then, then it is not easy to allow every government people to use the chat GBD within our network within the government. I mean, if you, you, you can use a standalone PC or your smartphone, then it, it could be okay, but there are some risks. Then we have to identify the right risks. We don't have to worry too much, but still we have to, I mean, then, then the, 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 the UNESCO can come in to, to help us understand better what the technology is. Or like, for example, maybe before that the AI came in, they got, there were some challenges in the cloud services. You know, like uh, the, the government is more like uh, prefer to have the, the data within the building in the government, on-premise type of services. But uh, of course, there are uh, some advantage in the cloud services in terms of the, the cost and uh, some efficiency and et cetera. But still, we have to know more about the security or like SLA type of things to know better about the cloud service then so that we can get the best advantage of the cloud service in our service. So uh, there, there are many, many things that uh, we are expecting that the UNESCO and uh, your partners and you know, working harder to, to help us to do the better service in Japan. So I mean, it goes to everybody, I think, I hope. so. Uh, thank you very much. Just up here. 
Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, those examples. And actually, these are some of the challenges across governments around the world. It's not only in Japan, it's, it's in different com countries. And, and I'm hoping that we'll hear more about that also today. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll play the second video and then I'll like to move also to the online. I know that a lot of people have connected on Zoom as well. So may I invite the, the technical team to play the second video and then we'll go online. Artificial Intelligence and Digital Transformation Competencies for Civil Servants. To strengthen government organizations for the digital age, we need to meet the challenges of digital transformation. This doesn't mean public sector officials have to become specialists, but they do need a solid understanding of how technologies work and of their impacts. This is where the Artificial Intelligence and Digital Transformation Competency Framework comes in. Built on exhaustive global and regional research, it articulates essential digital competencies that public sector officials need. There are three competency domains that are interlinked and complementary. Digital planning and design. This enables better understanding of the volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous problems policymakers face. It will allow policymakers to identify opportunities to use digital solutions and strategies, and to handle possible unwanted consequences. Data use and governance. This competency provides a deeper understanding of the data life cycle. It will support policymakers in addressing governance issues and public expectations while using data effectively and ethically. Digital management and execution. This empowers policymakers to apply new management and collaboration tools in government. It will enable them to harness data, new technologies, tools and approaches to solve complex problems and foster civic participation. In addition, digital transformation also requires a mindset that enables trust, creativity, adaptability, curiosity and experimentation. Digital transformation is everywhere. And the knowledge and skills divide across governments is expanding. Let us leave no one behind. Those who are prepared are the ones who will benefit the most and create the most benefit. I'd encourage you to check out the report at a later point. Uh, I now open the floor and really start with the conversation uh, today. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Gianluca Misuraka, who's joining us online at 1.30 a.m. in Seville. Uh, Gianluca, uh, if, you can, if you can take the floor and share some of your thoughts around what kind of, what kind of work you're doing, what kind of capacity building are you doing uh, with your AI for Gov program, but also what are the skills and knowledge we need uh, in today's age in the public sector? So over to you, Gianluca. Thank you, Pratek, and good morning. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, loud and clear. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's true, here is almost uh, two o'clock in the morning, and actually calling from Rome today. But um, yes, I'm normally based in Seville. Well, when I'm not traveling, so it's a pity I could not make it to IGF. That was the plan when we discussed with Pratex. So sorry for that. And uh, I hope you are enjoying the, the forum and uh, I'm following it from uh, from remote. So I, I will just share, uh, I prepare a few slides if you allow me to, to, to share and uh, try to be brief. But um, yeah, that's some something that... Uh, I want to share with you is exactly the the you know the topic of the day is uh, whether uh, uh, you know we are able uh, as civil servants and policy makers actually uh, to to master the the digital governance and the uh, especially AI that is now you know artificial intelligence is. Uh, uh, what everybody is talking about, I know it's, uh, there are a lot of sessions at the IGF on this topic, also closed door meetings like this morning there was a discussing about the global governance issue of AI. And so if 
we are actually ready for disruption. Now, that's something more than what already the video showed and what Pratik was saying. And I'll try to go brief on a few issues. So basically, uh, the why we are still lacking after more than 20 years of the, the, you know, the global digital governance framework that we are uh, I mean, we are in much need for 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 this um, topic, and uh, uh, maybe we should also be a bit back to fundamentals. Everybody's talking about chat GPT and generative AI. That's very exciting, but maybe we still have to fix uh, some of the basics in our uh, public administrations. And that's why we we propose, and I'll show a bit of what we're doing with the AI for God Master. Uh, we need what we call functional specialists for supporting let's say the governance of ai and that's um, what what we are also trying to do with the colleagues of unesco um, that we partner with uh, to to build a compass for digital governance and ai capacity uh, so briefly, I, I mean, I was working for the UN, the General Secretariat, back in uh, 2002. At the time, uh, Kofi Annan was the Secretary General, and he was uh, pushing very hard on the, you know, for the fight against the digital divide, and uh, showing the sense of urgency that we had already at the time, very, very clear. And uh, as ICTs, uh, uh, as we were calling at the time, uh, were actually already about to change the world, and they did so, but. Uh, 20 years later, the Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres is still calling for the need to really making sure that we can uh, manage this digital transformation. And we basically need to do this in a human centric uh, uh, way. Um, and that's why probably, I mean, for, for next year, there's the need to, to propose something, uh, um, let's say, concrete to make sure that uh, we can have still the open, free, inclusive, and secure digital uh, governance that we, uh, we we deserve. And that's a very important role for governments uh, in addition to all, all other stakeholders. Uh, so this shows also the, the need and the urgency for equipping the civil servants and policymakers with the skills and the capacity, as it was mentioned before, uh, needed to also address these uh, uh, big challenges. Um, now, going back to the fundamentals, as I said, we need to really rethink a bit the way we address uh, public sector innovation, um, I mean, in a data-driven society, so data is fundamental, that's one of the key competencies that was mentioned before in the, in the video, uh, and clearly we need to address the multidimensional complex uh, uh, issues that are uh, linked to the digital transformation. It's not just digitalizing uh, or, you know, putting some uh, computers in in the room as really completely reframing and changing the way we address the um, you know the digital transformation strategy i mean i won't go into details but just want to mention that uh, when i was um, still working um, for the european commission jrc a joint research center uh, we did a, a comprehensive review of literature and practice on this with a specific focus on the european union and we saw that uh, despite the you know the quite a big rhetoric on this topic and the claim many governments has done over the year, there's still a lot to be done. And uh, um, at the policy level, it's important to be really clear on what is, uh, um, you know, the objective of these transformational strategies we want to, to um, let's say, <clears throat> to, you want to unleash. And so the question is, if we are ready for it, uh, this was also one of the questions in the, in the video, and actually, the, the answer is yes, no, <laughs> because uh, uh, data shows actually the very not rosy picture. And the latest, uh, I mean, the data from ITU shows in their dashboard that actually, uh, uh, for instance, despite there is an effort to, to you know, to equip, uh, uh, you know, to prepare to have uh, uh, digital ready countries in the world, only few uh, actually have uh, a mat mature national framework. Um, and even, uh, let's say, uh, advanced countries like the UK uh, that uh, no, notably quite uh, always been a pioneer in this topic, uh, they showed in uh, recent data from the National Audit Office that only 20% of their civil servants actually are equipped with, uh, uh, with the skills needed to manage the, the digital future, as they say. It. So this uh, shows that um, uh, we need a lot of this uh, capacity building, but this is not just the technical skills that are needed. And actually, uh, uh, what we did with the AI for Go 
of program that is a, a program implemented by the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid and Politecnico di Milano, also in collaboration with other partner university in Estonia and Germany, is to design a master that actually address what we call specialist uh, um, role, uh, based also uh, not only on teaching and training theoretical issues or technical work, but actually based on, on, on real project uh, and concrete uh, um, and concrete cases. And at the same time, we're trying to build, and that's why the collaboration with UNESCO, an ecosystem that, of course, starts, for, starts from the European Union, but actually has a, a global uh, outreach uh, um, and ambition to create a network worldwide. Right. Um, so the master in particular that I'm, I have the pleasure to, 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 to direct uh, is actually training. Uh, at the moment, we are in the third edition. We, are, we, we, we have trained 120 uh, executives from all over the world. More than 40 countries are represented. And here, the idea is really to focus on the governance aspect of AI that are fundamental, uh, the, the human-centric uh, uh, principles for, uh, you know, for service design and AI of AI systems. And that's very important important because while we of course have uh, experts from the AI and, and data science, we also have uh, uh, um, specific complementary um, skills from uh, the design department of Politecnico di Milano. Uh, so the question here is not uh, what kind of AI to use or what techniques or what methodology or technology, but it's rather if we really need to use AI, for instance, uh, on a specific uh, uh, um, design uh, service, and now we can redesign the, the entire process to make sure that we use the best technology, the more appropriate technology. So we, of course, focus on the use of AI in the public sector, but also uh, there is uh, the importance of public procurement that was uh, actually mentioned in the intervention from the, the host uh, um, representative. So to get to the conclusion, uh, Gianluca, we can't hear you for some reason. Can you try again? No. Sadly, we uh, don't hear your conclusion. Ah. <laughs> okay, now you're back. Okay. Okay, I don't know what happened. So maybe we were, uh, uh, I don't know, we were uh, <laughs> banned from the conclusion or <laughs> it was, uh, I don't know. Okay, so just, can you hear me, no? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, okay, so I hope I'm not taking too long. Uh, so but basically, yeah, just get into the conclusion. So yeah, the work that we are, um, I mean, we are doing with uh, with um, with Pratink and colleagues of UNESCO is uh, um, actually, I would say, quite ambitious and it was very interesting because we've been uh, trying to to develop a comprehensive um, approach to operationalize exactly the framework that has been developed by UNESCO uh, that, of course, uh, provide the principles, the, 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 the guidelines, uh, the, uh, and the specific, um, let's say, orientation. Uh, but now we need to design and develop, and that's what we've been doing with colleagues, uh, um, a self-assessment methodology for making sure that policymakers and civil servants, both at individual level, but also organizational level, can actually be um, you know, empowered, if you want, uh, because by first at assessing the needs and then developing specific uh, uh, tools that can help them, uh, um, let's say, be um, improve their capacity. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are supporting uh, UNESCO um, on designing and defining what are uh, the, the, let's say the, the principle for uh, an open uh, educational um, resources repository that could support also the, the digital capacities navigator that UNESCO and partners are actually uh, developing. And at the same time, uh, we, are, we have proposed a, an outline of a, of a short-term curriculum, I mean, curriculum for a short-term uh, training for policymakers that based on this compass uh, could actually uh, be immediately operationalized and in fact, uh, I mean, I don't know if Protec, we can say that there will be a first uh, pilot uh, training uh, uh, soon in, uh, in Africa and others, I guess, will, uh, uh, will follow. 
so just to, to, I mean, without going into details, what we have been doing, we, of course, uh, we started from the work uh, UNESCO and the Broadband Commission uh, with ITU did uh, of this uh, competence framework. Uh, we've been, uh, um, I mean, reconceptualizing certain issues, but we also engaged uh, um, some of the participants in the AI for God Master and other experts uh, in uh, validating some of the of the proposal we made for having, uh, you know, a self method, a self assessment methodology. And then we, of course, uh, propose this um, based, based on questionnaires, uh, some tools uh, that could be then uh, um, piloted and further developed into this uh, uh, digital governance and uh, artificial intelligence compass uh, or competence compass. So just to mention that also we are trying to align with, uh, uh, with the canvas, we call it the functional specialist canvas of AI for Gov that we are also developing, uh, because here the, the difficulty is to create some probably for some new professional roles or some new figures that we need, some new profiles that we need in uh, in the public administration in particular, is not the super uh, data scientist, the super expert in AI, but it's rather someone that understands how this technology can be used, how, how to procure, uh, uh, let's say, systems that are ethical and uh, appropriate and context-based. And of course, uh, we have three areas here. One is the management, uh, the technology also, and the policy and legal and ethical aspect. And these are all, uh, in, in, let's say, embedded into what we call digital governance, basically. And we've been doing this with a number of colleagues and through some uh, um, expert uh, peer review and validation. Um, also to underline the importance uh, not just to be you know, the best uh, technical expert, but actually uh, this is a multidisciplinary field. So we need to really combine hard and soft skills. And some of these soft skills are what uh, is uh, uh, sometimes making the difference. Um, it's not enough. I mean, it's not so important or not important for all, especially at the highest level of the hierarchy to be uh, technically a super uh, expert, but rather uh, it's important to have this interplay between soft and hard skills that is fundamental. And of course, uh, what we have to also uh, understand, this is a teamwork. Um, it's not just the individuals that need to be um, empowered, but it's rather the team, the organization department that deal with these complex issues. And so to conclude, this is the first uh, sketch of the work we've been doing over the summer, basically to, to, to exactly try to personalize it three main areas that was mentioned by, by um, I mean, the video that are included in the digital competence framework of UNESCO. So the digital planning and design, the data generation, the use of governance, and also the management implementation part. So uh, here we have a self-assessment uh, uh, toolkit that is being uh, developed uh, with this uh, uh, initial training uh, that uh, will be tested and piloted with the idea, and this is a more forward-looking, to have uh, also um, as part of this uh, digital governance and AI competence compass, uh, a kind of uh, knowledge sharing community that could also be um, instrumental to the work that UNESCO and partners are actually uh, um, doing in these digital capacities um, navigators. Um, so I will stop here uh, and um, thank you for the attention. And of course, if there's any question or comment, happy to, to, to take on board. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gianluca. And thanks for joining us uh, in the middle of your night as well. Uh, feel free to stay, but I understand that you have to leave and sleep at some point as well. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll open the floor now. Actually, the first prompt is really around what kind of digital skills and competencies that you have uh, seen uh, are needed in governments from your perspective in different parts of the world? Uh, what, what are these areas and how can we as a global collaborative coalition work towards this? Uh, I'm also glad that we have some members of parliament here. So it's a really uh, multi-stakeholder uh, grouping today. So I'll open the floor. Uh, we don't go by any particular order. Uh, so anyone who wants to take the floor, just raise your hand and we'll pass on the mic. Odas. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm Odas, um, a CEO of Digital Muganda, so I'm coming more uh, from a private sector perspective. Um, I think a lot of the discussions around um, AI this week has gone around uh, balancing regulation and also innovation. Um, I think uh, I'll touch more on the innovation, but in terms of regulation, I think uh, the discussion we've had even earlier this week with the parliamentarians 
um, is around the fact that uh, lack of, of competences around uh, uh, the digital skills and, 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 and AI skills uh, leads to um, um, prohibitive measures or prohibitive uh, laws instead of permissive uh, and assistive laws. Um, so I think in terms of regulation, that lack of those competences could hinder the adoption of, of AI in the public sector. Uh, but speaking on the innovation side, um, I think that on all levels, uh, if there are no um, skills in terms of understanding, um, identifying the benefits uh, of what uh, artificial intelligence could bring, but also balancing and identifying also the risks that it could also pose um, hinders the adoption, obviously. Uh, starting from um, the first cycle, which is the managerial buy-in, um, so if you go to a government institution and um, it's working with a with a, um, with a private sector company, I think the first phase is is, is the buy-in from from the management and um, uh, the misunderstanding of of, of these technologies uh, first and foremost hinders um, either by uh, overlooking the benefits or uh, by um, not putting in safety nets that. Uh, really could make sure that these technologies are safe and are safe to use. And also moving past that, I think one thing that we've seen is that uh, from the private sector and moving now from the buy-in to the co-development of, of these projects and, 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 and handover, uh, one of the things that, the, that we see is that once we start co-developing with, with the public sector, um, and then we reach a phase where we had to we have to hand over uh, these projects is that the lack of of, of these technical skills on the teams uh, hinders um, uh, this project sustainability, uh, making uh, it hard for um, the developers who are mostly in the private sector uh, to hand over to you know public institution um, to take over the projects and and internalize and fully oper operationalize them. So I think across all all the spectrum of development, the life cycle uh, coming from the buy-in and the co-development and the handover, uh, it's really important for um, uh, these skills and also um, uh, knowledge um, advancements, which is one of the competences that that, that is in this framework. Um, to be able to um, fully digitize or uh, have a true digital transformation. Yeah. Thanks, Alas. Uh, anyone else would like to take the floor? Yes, uh, okay, so, okay, that's wonderful. Uh, so we go with Miriam first. Please feel free to introduce yourself and then, sir, we'll, we'll come from here and then to you. Okay, so. It is working. So my name is Mimi Stankovic. Nice meeting you all. Um, I am a principal digital policy specialist with DAI. Um, piggybacking on um, uh, the previous uh, comments, um, I would like to also uh, stress the need. I work with different governments and we uh, work on capacity building. Um, we work in uh, Southeast Asia, we work in Africa, and um, you know, I have worked with div dif different civil servants, uh, different um, um, managerial levels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I, uh, I skim through Pratik, um, the AI and digital transformation competency framework, and I agree with the previous discussants uh, that we need to have competences um, along the life cycle of digital technologies. So this is. Uh, really important, and, and especially in the context of AI, I think these should be even more granular. So you talk about digital planning and design, data use and governance, and digital management and execution. I would add another phase, and this is monitoring, evaluation, and learning, so the, the, the male phase. And then with respect to government working with the private sector, I have seen, you know, in Eastern Europe, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, you know, everywhere I go, um, uh, you know, donors, they insist on public-private partnerships, but this is really important. Uh, this is very challenging, very difficult to achieve. And what we need is digital champions within government. So we need more contextual, uh, more granular, more targeted approach to these competences. So, um, you know, we, we need um, one approach when um, addressing uh, digital transformation and AI issues 
uh, for uh, you know um, um, uh, higher echelons of civil servants or um, the managerial echelon, and then you know like normal people working with uh, for the government. So there is um, another type of um, skills and competencies that we need for uh, for uh, uh, this type of um, uh, civil servants. So um, what else? Um, so and a, a model that is uh, that used to function uh, in practice uh, with respect to um, a digital champions in government is the model of digital transformation officers in Ukraine. So you could take a look at it and see how these officers uh, um, uh, have worked. Um, uh, those are they, th those are basically appointees uh, from the Ministry of Digital uh, Transformation of Ukraine that are embedded in different teams um, uh, throughout different ministries and agencies in Ukraine. And this is really important to have champions within different um, agencies and ministries that are going to champion the cause of digital transformation and how digital transformation can be, um, um, how digital services can be improved and what does this mean? And uh, I, I want to I, I put the focus on um, uh, simplifying things because mm -hmm. what I have seen is that we come up with all these wonderful terms. So algorithmic transparency, algorithmic accountability, ethics. But when you work with um, you know uh, civil servants, governments, um, different government entities, uh, public officials, they say, oh, th these terms are wonderful. Okay, so ethics, um, accountability, and transparency. But what do they mean in practice? Okay. So we talk about human-centric approaches, but then try working and um, you know institutionalizing capacity-building programs um, um, in different countries around the globe, and you know equipping civil servants with different digital skills. It's not easy at all. Okay, just putting it out there. Thanks, Thank Mimi. That also compliments a lot. I think we have a strong private sector with Oda setting the stage uh, on uh, the need for the public sector to to be able to, uh, for digital transformation along the life cycle. Uh, okay, so, okay, we go. I, I would first like to pass the floor to some women speakers because we have been a lot of men speaking first. So perhaps I go to Amrita and then to Risper. Thank you, Pratik, and thank you. Um, apologies for being late. Uh, I think um, my name is Amrita Chaudhary. I represent a civil society organization, CCUI from India. And looking at it from the civil society lens, and I agree with what Odison you just mentioned, a uh, few more things. Uh, obviously, capacity building is important. But before any government or any department of a government goes in for a digital transformation, I think they need to actually do a deep dive study on the impacts. Um, that's very important. And having a multi-stakeholder discussion at that point of time, not only the private, public, but even the individual, the end users into consideration would have a more nuanced understanding of what the ultimate product would be. Because many times, intentions are great, but the execution at the end is not seamless. So I think that is very important. Buy-in between, like, if I'm looking at countries like, such as India, you have state, uh, you know, you have the center which implements something, but states also implement something. So there has to be synergy between the state. There has to be a buy-in from the civil civil servants in the state to that. It should not be, uh, and for that, the capacity building is important. That this is going to help you. It's not going to take away. You know, it's not going to. Uh, harm you. Many times civil servants, you know, of different age categories think new technologies, new processes, uh, you know, they have a pushback in their mind. So I think that needs to be demystified. Similarly, just as, you know, capacity building on technology is important, having a rights-based approach while implementing is important because many times those are overlooked. As in, it's not a conscious thing, but unconsciously those are uh, not looked in. So I think those are important and countries such as us, which is multilingual, having it in different languages, end-to-end -end is important. For example, I'll give you, many of our websites are on different Indian languages. But if a citizen wants to do something end-to-end, -end, some parts, for example, the payment gateway is in English. 
so if you can have an end-to-end -end in a particular language, even voiced-based, because not many people read. Uh, they don't like to read, I would say. Many people don't read emails too. So I think uh, you know, using those kind uh, of innovative technology, what people will adopt, because at the end of the day, anything you bring in is for people to use it. If it's not used, it would not work. And thank you. Thanks, Amrita, for that insight. Uh, Risper, you wanted yeah. to take Can you just <laughs> go this way? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Pratik. Uh, my name is Rispo Nyango uh, from the Lawyers Hub, Nairobi, Kenya. And I think just to echo, you know, the sentiments in the room, recently we ran um, our annual conference, which is called the Africa Low Tech Festival. And for this year, we were focusing on um, the digital public infrastructure, and we kind of tend to look at the different facets, you know, um, the interlinkages with either AI, um, technology issues, and all that. And so one of the projects that we were running um, together with co-develop was trying to look at how we can um, first um, do an assessment and then also create awareness, particularly for policymakers and CSOs. And so we ran a survey, um, we did a number of workshops, and it was very interesting. Um, the same things that we are finding in the room, whereby first the level of involvement and awareness on most of these issues was actually really low for, for many of the participants. So we tried to run it across um, 24 African countries with representatives both from the CSO community um, and some members of parliament and a higher percentage of them actually had no involvement in, um, say, in the, in the case that you are looking at, um, DPIs. So they, they don't really have um, conversations or understandings around, you know, uh, whether it's data governance, whether it is uh, digital ID, you know, and, and getting into, having that as a starting point, I think is actually very important. Like she was saying, the assessments um, would come really key. But I think what I'd like to emphasize also is the multidimensional aspect of it. Um, and that's what we find in the public sector. So you find that there are very many um, arising issues or conversations, and sometimes we try to have like a linear line to it, and yet we are facing very many simultaneous issues. So for instance, in Kenya, we are having so many cross-cutting conversations. We are looking at blockchain, we are looking at digital ID, we are looking at data protection, and sometimes we want to be rigid and um, kind of have us a straight jacket approach to it, but I think it's very important that we actually consider that the public sector actually operates cross-cuttingly, you know, on these issues, so that even as we are trying to curate sol solutions around it, then we are actually informed of how they operate, yeah. Thanks, Rispa, Paula, and then we go to the gentleman there. <laughs> Well, good morning and well, good afternoon to everyone online. Um, my name is Paula Galvez. I'm from Peru, former uh, strategic advisor to the presidency of the Council of Ministers. And that's where I uh, provided my service to develop the digital talent national strategy. And as a bottom-up process, uh, in a multi-stakeholder way, we came to the conclusion that we could not have the same strategy for everyone in the public sector. So we divided this in three different um, users or so audiences. First, we have in the in the public sector methodologies or geeks. I mean, people who know about technology, who are in the IT area, and definitely need different kind of capacity building. Then we have the users um, who need to be literate consumers. Um, but not really, they, they don't need to be experts. They need to understand the technology that are using, why it is important, and also, super important here, grab some capacity building on the ethical access and privacy. Because we, we received uh, many concerns from academia and civil society that sometimes when they use the technology that were offered by the Peruvian government, they would ask too many information in the forms, for instance. And when we ask them, hey, and why are you asking the ID here? Mm, no, because we were used to this. So yeah, uh, actually that's where we need to uh, also engage the Ministry of Justice to talk about the privacy that they tagged, for instance. And then the third uh, layer is decision makers, um, because they need to know enough about technology to make decisions and to bring this culture that was uh, very well explained in the video, Pratik, and we were, were all t talking about. 
digital transformation is not using tech, it's actually the shift in mindset. Um, and also for that, and, and while we were developing the national strategy, we created the Digital Talent National Platform, where we try to make it easy for Peruvian public servants to develop these skills. But what we noticed is that female public servants were the least consumer, uh, sorry, servants enrolling on these courses and finishing these courses. So what is happening here, of course, there are not enough motivations and female servants have other um, tasks at home that don't uh, allow them to have the time to complete these courses. So here what I would like to stress is first let's think about our different audiences when we're thinking about capacity building in the public sector. Second, always wear gender lenses uh, when we're thinking about these policies. And third, um, create motivations. Uh, I was discussing with friends from the UAE and Colombia. They have fantastic motivations. For instance, very briefly, uh, in the UAE they have like badges that will be earned only when they finish their certifications and when they apply the certifications to their roles, which will be counted in their annual evaluations. So this will make give them eager to have this. In the Peruvian case, for instance, and I, I believe now in the government they are working on it, is how to create this motivation so that they can make create more time because this is something apart from the daily tasks they have, right? Uh, so yes, this is just my main three points. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paula. Uh, over to you, sir. Okay, do we have a mic there? If we can just pass one around. Uh, Good morning. Um, my name is Rudolf Griedel. I'm um, Director General for uh, Central Affairs that encompasses um, HR, um, IT, and other things in the German Ministry for Digital Affairs. Um, first of all, uh, I want to thank you for organizing this um, open forum and um, also to say that everything I'm hearing here and everything that has been presented, uh, it is very clear that um, these issues and these challenges are um, the same everywhere. Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America, I think we are all more or less in the same situation that we have vested civil servants uh, structures, public service structures that um, have been functioning in one way or another for decades. And uh, now that we are at this point where we want to go to the digital transformation, I think that has been said in several uh, uh, interventions before, and I want to emphasize this also from my personal experience in our, in our administration. At the beginning, the transformation has nothing or very very few to do with digitalization. It has to do with a cultural mindset and it has to do with um, looking at administrative processes. How, how do they work? Um, what are the layers of administration that we have um, created over the decades for ourselves and are they really necessary? And only if we look at these processes, at these um, internal um, ways how we operate and only once we have optimized those ways we can then go into digitalization because if you if you if you take the old way of doing it and you put a computer on it you still have a very um, poor process behind it and it doesn't and it, and it won't and it won't create good results so people will say, oh, you see, this digitalization, is, it's worth nothing and it brings only harm and it brings work. So that's one point. The second point is um, we are trying to always have a, a double gain, 
when we introduce new uh, digital tools and this double gain has to be for uh, the customer, for the citizen, for the user. That is very important, but it has also to be on the administrative side. So, um, because then you have a chance to take the civil servants on board and uh, to convince them that it's a good thing to do. Um, I mean, in, in Germany, other than perhaps other countries, we have a very poor demography. And so we are older and older. We do not have so many uh, young people again on the, on the employment market. So we need these um, computers and machines to help us to provide the same services and the same quality as we did before with like 100 persons now with 80 or 60. So we have to we have to have a gain uh, on the administrative side in order to take people on board and in order to start this cultural mind shift. And um, so thank you very much for this. And um, I, uh, I, 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 I I'm really learning a lot here from all of you. And uh, I'm looking forward to continue the exchange. Thank you. Thank you. I see there are several more hands. And I will come back here first and then go back again this side. And yes. So, Peter, over to you. Good morning, everybody. And um, indeed, very interesting conversation. My name is Peter Marien. I'm uh, working for the European Commission in DG INTPA. Uh, I'm team leader for digital governance. Um, a few comments uh, from my side. So uh, at INPA, digital uh, became a priority a few years ago. And when we um, started looking at that, we, of course, were in the middle of the, um, the COVID, post-COVID um, situation when there was this huge shift, even more than before, one could argue, towards um, having society moving uh, online in many aspects of society. So. Uh, as we worked with our partner countries, because that's part, you know, that's a lot of our mandate is to work with partners uh, outside of Europe. Um, we wanted to to um, make sure, let's say, that we're all together uh, seeing the um, the benefits of this digital this digital shift, let's say, but also that we manage the risks. So b both were important, and also we looked at this um, from a let's say a global perspective. So we were not focusing only at national digital transformation, for example, within certain administrations or other aspects of society, which is important, but also uh, how do we see the global aspects of this uh, when you talk about data transfers, uh, privacy, and eventually also, you know, sovereignty of nations, information, access to information, those things. Um, so, um, of course, to have these kind of discussions, and I fully agree, we need them as much internally in our organization as, as uh, anywhere else. We need the, this um, uh, capacity to, to be increased. Um, and that's, so there, I just wanted to, to share a few things that we've been doing. So um, just a few more things before I go into some examples. So we, as I said, we wanted to make sure that we reap the benefits, but also avoid the risks. And these risks, uh, to, to be you know, blunt about it, are also geopolitical. So uh, we wanted to also uh, make sure that the capacity is there, that ourselves and our partners avoid being captured, captured by um, states, uh, methodologies, and also by, by companies. <coughs> and and their and the you know the their value sets that go with that and uh, I heard already the, the the term human centric here so for us this this is very important uh, this human centric approach where we put the the individual at the center and not not the company and not the state so when we thought okay so how do we go about this uh, we linked this also to our objective to support and work with our multilateral institutions. So this is just for context. So we, we put this in the context also of working with multilaterals um, and specifically also with um, the UN uh, United Nations Agency and again based on the, the, the principles of the UN charters and this human-centric approach. So what have we been doing uh, concretely? Just to give a few examples. We have, um, we have an agreement ongoing with uh, UNESCO uh, on the topic of AI, so this is a, a few million euro, I won't go into too much details, but uh, a large uh, objective here is also to work on these topics of 
if I can call them capacity building, you can call it more or less, but let's say uh, it includes capacity building on the topic of artificial intelligence and, and uh, you know, working with partner countries around the world. We also have an agreement with um, ITU and UNDP together, uh, so jointly, so it's a few million euro, it's just recently been signed. And the idea there is to train a few thousand civil servants uh, around the world, so it's global. Um, I mean, UNESCO is also global. <coughs> and um, uh, that that is training, we can argue for years about this, but it's training online and off offline. So it is online and different types of online training, but it also includes uh, offline training. Um, and that training, I would call it like digital diplomacy type training. Uh, and it includes um, training on AI, and for that, uh, ITU and UNDP will work also with UNESCO. Um, we also are. We also have an, another project that just started recently, where we are working, and this is specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, with regulators. I also heard the regulator uh, question coming up. So uh, that's um, about 34 million euro at the moment, uh, where we're also working with other U EU member states. And the idea there is to work with regulators in Sub-Saharan Africa, and indeed, um, this approach will be much more based maybe on the notion, I could say, of working with champions and with working with the notion of change management. And I completely agree with what was said before about this not just being about digital and computers, but indeed about uh, you know what was said by, by my predecessor. Um, also to emphasize that we have absolutely realized that we need capacity building in-house. This is in our own unit, <laughs> in our own uh, DG, in the Commission, also in our delegations around the world. We have uh, you know, many delegations around the world, offices, embassies, and everybody needs to be um, skilled. Uh, and again, it's not about using computers, but about all these other aspects. Uh, and so we are trying to do that um, actively. Um, and then maybe just to respond, uh, because of course we have many partners here, uh, the session today was about civil servants, but of course I think civil society there is key. And we also have, under the same general umbrella, uh, a program that we're just starting with two consortia of CSOs uh, globally to work on capacity building for digital. Um, and that includes for them to be able to join uh, discussions like this one. So we are explicitly asking them to join discussions at uh, IGF, ITU, ICANN, IETF, and so on, so that they are part of uh, this whole discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter, for, for sharing the, the multilateral dimension and what kind of global work you're doing. Uh, I think we, we move to some parliamentarians. Uh, so over to you, uh, yes, uh, the gentleman, and, yeah, and then to you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sam George. I'm a member of parliament from Ghana. I think that uh, in having these conversations, we need to appreciate that the different demographics, especially in different sectors. When we look at the public service, for example, if I use Ghana, the public service is made up of the civil service, and then you've got the executive government machinery, you've got the judiciary, and then you've got parliament. Now, the approaches to introducing digital tools in all of these various sectors of the public service cannot be the same. When we try to approach this with a one cup size fits all, you have challenges. Ghana's demographic is different from Germany, but we have the same problem, where we have a very aged civil service. In fact, many of them will tell you they are BBC, born before computers. <laughs> and, and so the, 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 the approach to digital uptake is different from if you were talking, for example, to the private sector or if you were talking, for example, to Parliament, where you've got a mixed demographic. Now, the challenge with Parliament, where I sit, will be that a lot of the capacity building is tailored for members of Parliament. And that's fine. But then that is just half of the solution. Members of Parliament face attrition. In many African parliaments, your longevity is maximum eight years, or maximum two terms. So when you invest a lot of capacity building in just the members of parliament and not the parliamentary service, which is the technical bureaucracy, 
that survives longer than the members of parliament because there are technical persons in parliament who've been there for 25 years and 30 years. They see various iterations of parliament. That is a cadre that we need to focus on because they provide the technical support for members of parliament in pushing legislation and all the technical work. So I think that that's an area we need to look at. Same happens with the judicial service. There is more longevity there for a judge who gets appointed to the bench. If you give them the requisite training, then they're able to have better interpretation of legislation and, 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 and all of that. Then when you, and, and, and I get the benefit of having worked in the civil service and then transitioning into the government machinery, working in the office of the president before finding myself in parliament now. And so I see the various iterations there. The last point I want to make is the fact that we need to understand the life cycle of introducing digital, especially on the African continent. A lot of governments in Africa are talking about digitization because that's the in thing. A lot of European and Western funding is available for digitization. But digitization is just literally us moving from our analog systems to digital systems. The main concept of digitalization itself, which is the next phase of digitization, is lost on many African governments. And many governments, are, frankly, across the world. And then the whole concept of digital transformation. So being able to have that complete life cycle established for the public sector, that digitization is just one step of it, is just one small minutia of the whole process. We need to get to the digital transformation through digitalization. It's a critical part of getting this actually implemented so that we just don't have check boxes that are ticked so that our countries are, appear to be compliant, but implementation is actually zero. And that's why I think a lot of the focus must be on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I, I just, I think this conversation will go on. But uh, we have about half an hour left, and I would, uh, so please take the floor. We have time, and I would not totally stick to the script because I like the conversation is flowing. We are learning from each other. We'll, we'll keep it, but keep the remarks as, sure. uh, as brief as possible so that we, everyone can All have right. a chance. So. Hi, I'm Damien Cepeda. I'm a senator from Mexico. And, uh, well, thinking of the topic, uh, I think when you want to push an agenda an agenda in civil public service and government and parliamentary uh, you, you you need to look at two specific things we need information and we need resources resources access funding or whatever cost benefits uh, in information we need information for the scope of opportunity of the technology in a specific topics because most of the countries that are underdeveloped or like not fully developed, the members of Congress or the government servants are thinking about health issues, security issues, education issues, a specific problems of the people right now, not in like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So what we need to do, I think so, is to put the information that makes uh, uh, reasonable to take an agenda in pushing uh, in, uh, internet, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, technology, in all these areas to make a specific benefits to the people. And you need to identify key players, not everybody, key players, key members of Congress, key members of government that you need to convince that if you invest in this technology, it would make an, a specific benefit for the people. That's one thing, information of opportunities. The other thing is information on the risks, because all the people that are making the decisions are always worried about what can happen if you open up all the technology without uh, correct uh, regulatory measures. Things of personal data, information, biometrics, and all of that stuff. Uh, things of the right to privacy, for example. What about public and private security surveillance? You know? So I think when you do these gatherings, or if I was UN, UNESCO, or whatever, I would um, give specific information to how to use it safe. And the third thing I think we need to get into it is specific costs. Uh, we need uh, infrastructure, uh, we need to uh, make uh, investments in 
schools, uh, public places, whatever, to get access to everybody. But if, if you don't do that, for example, in internet, uh, you, the, what happens is that you open the breach between the people that has access to technology information and the people that doesn't have it. So I think if we give the information to policymakers and to key decision players, uh, we can get like uh, the objectives done. Thank you, sir, for those thoughts. Uh, I'll come. Yeah. I'll come here to uh, Mr. Tarada, and then we come here, and then we go there. Finally, <laughs> and this. Oh, please come here. Don't don't stay at the back. Please come in the front on the table. Please, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my sincere um, uh, gratitude for um, being uh, invited here uh, as a speaker. My name is Takeo Harada, and I'm a CEO and a representative of the Institute for International Strategy and Information Analysis uh, located in Tokyo in Japan. Uh, before I have founded my own think tank, uh, easier. The, uh, this um, uh, institute is a total independent think tank in the private sector. But before um, uh, f having founded this think tank, I was a career diplomat. So uh, in the capacity uh, between bureaucracy, civil servants, on one hand, on the other hand, the private sector, uh, I'd like to make um, uh, three very short proposals. Uh, while I'm very pessimistic in terms of the digitalization uh, or uh, digital transformation, uh, in the, uh, particularly in the Japanese uh, bureaucracy, just uh, after our Japanese uh, civil servant friends had left the room, uh, I'm uh, very. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, make a sh very short statement, very honestly. Um, first of all, I think the, um, uh, by nature the bureaucracy is um, very reluctant to uh, be digital because um, uh, the civil servants are working on the, uh, politics, and politics, by nature, needs uh, in, uh, in transparency to make deal uh, with all the possible uh, stakeholders. So um, I think um, uh, before uh, uh, getting into the uh, discussion in detail of the competencies, uh, we should uh, differentiate from the easy uh, DX friendly tasks done by the civil servants from the others. For example, uh, as I said, I was a carry diplomat, but in diplomacy, uh, I, I cannot imagine that, the, for example, generative AI will make a final statement for the foreign minister or a prime minister. So uh, we should be very realistic. Yeah, we should be very, very realistic. So first point is uh, we should differentiate. Uh, different tasks uh, done by civil servants, and uh, maybe there are some fields uh, which are very uh, relevant to the uh, DX and AI, but some uh, others are not. So the second thing is we should enhance the public engagement because I'm terribly sorry, but I'm I'm a newcomer to this forum, but um, uh, the UNESCO's splendid works in terms of the DX and artificial intelligence is. Um, invisible enough, uh, particularly in the Japanese society. So we should we should involve much more uh, 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 much more public opinions so that we can boost uh, this movement uh, in terms of the introduction of the uh, artificial intelligence and the DX uh, to the civil servant world. Uh, for example, um, in Japan, maybe. Uh, all the friends and colleagues coming from the emerging market, emerging, uh, emerging countries, cannot imagine how acute the declining population issue uh, is, especially in Japan. All the Japanese so uh, social sectors are now urged to introduce uh, AI or the DX because uh, of lackness of the human capacity. So uh, this sentiment shared by the uh, public opinion should be mobilized uh, in connection with our works. 
uh, done uh, by this forum. And uh, last, but not, last but not the least, I'm still wondering what is the AI? Uh, I myself am um, uh, a global AI specialist, and uh, I'm still pessimistic because uh, AI, the AI technology, is just pattern matching, calculated, just calculated by the computer. So we need much more elaborated uh, AI technologies uh, so that uh, we can maybe uh, politics or civil servants cannot rely on uh, very sparse um, uh, outcomes uh, of the calculation done by the AI uh, in the uh, current status. So um, I would say uh, the UNESCO and our, our uh, DC alliance should uh, help all the uh, how can I say all the uh, endeavors done by the academia and also the, also the private sector and industries to make much better AI and uh, DX in, uh, technologies. That is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pra. Yeah, it was okay. it was my turn. Uh, thank you, Patrick, pa, for inviting uh, me to speak uh, in this uh, open forum. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tanes uh, UNESCO for you know putting this together. I know uh, you have put in a lot of work uh, to bring this uh, uh, for discussion. Uh, that is number one. Number two, I would like to raise my hand. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, my fingers are not the same. So all governments are not created equal. So, so we really have to know uh, this as we, uh, we, 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 we begin this discussion. And I would like to urge that, you know, we don't have to discuss this uh, as if we are concluding it today. We have just begun. And... It, this is a conversation, and I believe you know uh, what we have to do is to create partnerships with the government locally, for them to be able to you know uh, to 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 express what the needs are in terms of uh, capacity, uh, uh, digital capacity building for the uh, civil servants. I think that is very criti critical uh, in terms of achieving what we want because. Um, the issue is, uh, the question is, and your, your question that you asked was, are there really need for um, what sort of um, skills and competencies that we need? I believe that uh, to be able to get a set of skills and competencies that you need will vary from one government to another, uh, from one uh, uh, public sector uh, entity uh, to another. I'll try to share what uh, is happening with my government in Tanzania. Uh, uh, Tanzania has been implementing uh, what we call uh, Digital Tanzania. And you will find they have created a, a Zoom-like platform. It's called Imikutano, where internally they organize meetings uh, using this Imikutano um, uh, platform. So, so there are a lot of things that are happening uh, with governments you know, around the world that we need to learn the, uh, uh, from them as we create these uh, sort of partnerships you know, to implement uh, 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 you know, this capacity uh, building as a coalition. Um, I would like to, uh, to, to say one of the uh, skills that we'll need uh, in the governments uh, is, is, is the issue of you know, uh, data governance you know, training. Um, because many uh, governments are now implementing uh, data protection acts uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And I believe you know, uh, handling data is very important. Number, number three, is the issue of you know uh, digital customer service? In 2020, I write about you know 50 emails to different govern government agencies, um, and what do I get? Some of the uh, agencies reply to my emails, some don't. So um, 
some you know reply within a few hours others reply after maybe several days so what does it mean uh, to in terms of capacity building the issue of attitude change and and uh, that has been uh, uh, previously alluded by a friend from the uh, from from germany so i think there is a lot that will go into this in terms of making sure that uh, we, we also uh, create capacity in terms of uh, attitude change for the government officials uh, to, to learn about you know, digital customer care and, and, and whatnot. And uh, lastly, uh, I would like to say that um, as we, we move forward with this, it is very important, number one, we create um, uh, uh, partnerships so that you know what we are doing does not appear as though it is an imported menu that is being uh, you know uh, shoveled uh, uh, into the government in terms of their capacity building. So, uh, with that said, um, again, thank you for uh, what uh, you are doing to uh, for the capacity. Thank you, and yes. I think it's all of us doing, not us alone. Uh, and uh, it's just the start of the conversation to the gentleman over there in in white, and then I come to the lady here, and then Mike. Okay. Um, um, thank, thank you very much, and good morning. Um, I'm Honorable Alhaji Mbo from the Gambia, and uh, also I'm uh, the Vice Chair of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Um, I'm a member of parliament, but I came from the tech sector to be in parliament which is um, really a very, very different world than from what I used to know. Um, in any case, um, the digital transformation, um, personally, I think is a must for all governments now. So there is no um, going back, so we need to move forward. And in doing so, um, our governments actually must take the bull by the horn in trying to understand the capacity gap that they actually have. And to do that, um, first, you know, we talk about the civil servants, uh, which is crucial. Because at the end of the day, the policy making rests in their hands. Even though there's a big debate whether parliamentarians do policy, um, you know, it's debatable. But at the end of the day, what makes the policies work also rests in the hands of the members of parliament. So I think the two need to really work very closely just to ensure that we have what it means to get those policies to work. Now, in doing so, um, we, for me, I think there are multiple approaches we can use to ensure that we, we bridge this gap. Um, first, um, let's look at our education system, the curriculum that we actually have in our schools. I think this is the key area that we can start to build now for the future. Because like he said, we have a, you know, um, civil service or the public sector actually, the age gap also is really, in many countries actually, is not really very good. So to do that, we need to start building the younger generation to move up. Then um, the civil sound that we currently have, um, I think there needs to be a study to understand um, the various gaps they actually have because it cannot be one gap fits all. Like me personally, when I interact with some of them, I can easily tell that there's sometimes you have very, very big gap in some of them. But then in the other way around, you see some also that are, that are up there that they just need to do at the next level. So I think uh, tearing them, knowing exactly their level of competency also is gonna actually help in terms of the capacity building. And uh, um, uh, uh, the last one actually is also uh, what we are doing in the Gambia. I'm sure my, my colleague also gonna say something about that. Um, the government actually now is on a, a very rapid um, transformation. In fact, just last week, they transformed uh, one um, higher education of learning called the Management Development Institute into a college for the civil service. Um, that could actually help them to train them so that they can actually move to the next level in terms of um, developing the needs of the country. Thank you. In fact, I was in the Gambia earlier this year for training of the judiciary, and we had uh, about 50 magistrates and judges on AI, and it was a very fascinating discussion. Uh, sir, if it is also from the Gambia, can we, can we wait a bit and... Uh, it's a different approach. Okay, okay, but very quickly, please. Yeah, very quickly, yeah. I'm Pan Slate from the Gambia NRI. Um, my approach, I'll, I'm looking at it from the perspective uh, of being a computer scientist, looking at it being technology people and processes. Now, if you look at most countries, especially in the global south, taking the view from Africa, who are the nearest civil servants that deal with the people? Are those in the municipalities. So the strength of any digital transformation process must start with the municipalities. If you look at Seoul, 
um, the capital of South Korea, you look at their municipality, what they have done with digital transformation is amazing on how the common person can get services who reside in Seoul. And I think if we focus on building a bottom top from our municipalities, a big change will happen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's extremely important. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, I'm truly impressed. This room is a field of, filled with a wisdom, and I wish I could have a time to talk to you individually, one for an hour. So my name is Jingbo Huang. Uh, I'm from a United Nations University. So I don't know how many of you have heard of a UNU. The headquarters is in Tokyo. And we have, a, thank you, 13 research institutes in 12 different countries. Uh, every institute has its own specialty. And the one that I'm leading, uh, the institute in Macau, is specialized in uh, digital technologies. So uh, right now, our research, training, and education portfolio is mainly related to uh, AI governance, modeling for, um, uh, for disaster management, online child protection. So digital technology is our uh, bread and butter. So we have actually a, a, um, uh, a different types of a challenge because we are an interdisciplinary research team. Uh, like uh, this gentleman just said, we have a room full of uh, computer scientists specialized in AI, and we, uh, we have been just launching a series of uh, generative AI plus series, talking about uh, ChatGPT's impact on education. On uh, Actually, we're going to work on a, a, a series with the UNESCO on education, uh, on the environment uh, and the future, uh, the responsible AI. So we have a series of uh, generative AI plus. Um, so our challenge is to have a, we have a computer scientist and psychologist economist, but we want to hear about the real country context so that our, our knowledge can make sense. So we also have a training catalog ranging, you know, very, I can share, I'd be happy to share with you, um, but we do need a context from you. Uh, so uh, I would like to call for collaboration and both for training that we're offering, but also for the next conference that we're going to run in Macau in April as a UNU AI conference. And we're, we're gonna be 10 times smaller than IGF. But our approach would be very focused, problem driven. You have a, you have a specific issue, we bring private sector, our uh, academic research network together just to focus on one specific issue. Hopefully everybody goes home with uh, something concrete. So I would like to call for uh, participation and collaboration and uh, please come to me. I would love to talk to you for one hour each with each one of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, M Mikey, you wanted to take the floor and then the lady next to you. And so let's keep it to one minute. I know uh, it's it's hard, but it, there's a lot to talk about. So, I'll yeah. be uh, quick, I promise. Thanks, Pratik. I'm Mikey Zipinen, and uh, I've uh, worked in AI policy for, I think, f five or six years now. So I can bring the perspective of uh, people uh, drafting the national AI strategies or working on um, AI regulation, and I just like to bring up that it's very easy and everyday work to write plans and strategies on how to develop skills for, uh, you know, workforce or citizens or universities or really anyone else than and then yourself. And when it comes to uh, this part on uh, competencies of, of AI policy officers, it's actually kind of difficult and can be scary because starting this discussion means like inviting everyone to analyze like can I do my job and can our team actually do what we are supposed to do or do we have the skills so it's uh, it can be really hard <laughs> and uh, I feel like maybe this pressure comes uh, actually from a misunderstanding and it's really clear that we would um, need to put more effort into uh, clarifying that this is not really about turning civil servants into technical AI developers and like not everyone <laughs> needs to have a PhD in AI to write AI uh, regulation, for example. And uh, we should really stop saying things like, let's, uh, let's bring the real <laughs> technology experts in or, you know, we don't need to be experts on AI because uh, AI policymakers are, are also experts. It's just a like, different uh, emerging field of expertise. And I think this is what the competency framework is uh, all about. So 
that's uh, going to be a really good tool for uh, encouraging this uh, discussions. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Mikey. I move to Alexandre and then I come back. Alexandre. You can take, okay. Thank you, Patrick, and good morning, everyone. I'm Alexandre Barbosa, head of CETIC, which is a UNESCO Category 2 center based in Brazil. We are a regional center for Latin America and the Caribbean, and also Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa. Well, uh, I don't have much to say after all this wonderful debate, but I, I would like to, to mention that um, we are involved in measuring the social economic implications of the ICT adoptions by different sectors, including public sector. And we do run um, surveys um, every year with government to, to see the level of adoption. And it is really clear that having data, we give visibility to the problems and to the issues that we have to face and to address. Without data, we don't have visibility. So, uh, but more than have data, like uh, you, UNESCO is really um, making a very wonderful job in uh, making an assessment and to revealing um, the state of the adoption um, among civil servants. But we need, as our colleague from Ghana and also from um, Tanzania has mentioned, government is not a homogeneous body. So we need to have disaggregated data so that we can understand the different inequalities in terms of digital skills among civil servants in, in, in the government. We have different uh, structures like uh, central government, uh, state or provincial governments, local governments. Within those levels, we have different powers like legislative, judiciary, um, uh, executive, and the level of um, um, skills development is very different. I would say that among all countries here represented, we can say that is not the same. So we don't have um, one solution that will solve the whole uh, problems. But it is clear that when we go um, start to discuss how uh, or wha what are the challenges uh, in empowering civil service uh, in engaging in the digital transformation, we need to have disaggregated data. We need to understand what are the difference among civil servants. And besides the lack of digital skills that I, I guess all of us agree that we have a, a, an issue to be addressed, I would like to also mention three other things um, that was already mentioned uh, in terms of cultural change. Uh, governments are the oldest type of organization and the only type of organization that touches every us in the society. So the cultural resistance to change is really uh, enormous. Um, and besides that, I think that we need to develop a culture of continuous assessment. Many of you have mentioned uh, uh, the need of assessment, and uh, I think that we need to rely on um, institutions such as UNESCO to help member states to really uh, put in place uh, effective frameworks able to capture, able to measure, and to produce reliable data. And uh, last but not least, um, I would say that we have to work in a uh, other set of skills, not only digital skills, such as collaborations and um, best practice sharing. So those are few points that I would like to address. And once again, Pratik, I would like to congratulate UNESCO for this initiative, really very important. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Alexander. I think the point of uh, measuring digital skills is extremely important. Uh, actually, we don't have a global measure of this, and the kind of proxies which are still being used are not very sure they measure education. Uh, I think we'll we'll continue, but I think we can extend by five minutes if the uh, folks in the technical team allow us to. Uh, so we start while I figure out. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank everyone for a rich discussion. My name is Carolyn. I am with uh, a human rights organization called Access Now. So we work at the intersection of human rights and technology. And just, you know, there's a lot of shared sentiment in this room, I think, but just to highlight on a few things. One, um, you know, when we're talking about digital capacity building, I think we just cannot overlook the 
the major gaps that still exist in just knowledge about the relationship between those technologies and their human rights impacts and how human rights law applies to those particular technologies. So I think just making sure that we're keeping pace between the technology itself and also the human rights framework that it needs to operate inside of. Um, I think when we're talking about a human-centric approach to digitalization, we also need to really understand that that's not just about end users versus governments or private sector, but about people versus the technology itself. Um, the, just the language of digitalization or digital transformation, I think, lends itself to moving in a direction of seeing implementation of the technology as the end goal or the point, and it's just really not. And so I think, and it can be disruptive to a design process and can limit our capacity to really understand the problem that we're trying to solve in the first place. So I think really keeping people's experiences and to, to the Senator's point, um, being very specific about the problems we're actually trying to address to avoid overreach and misapplication of certain technologies. And I think just as a, as a final point, um, really understanding the way that these technologies impact people and communities at risk in ways that are very different than they apply to, to you know, end users in general. And those people and communities at risk are also the people who have been least effectively served by so many of, of these government agencies. And so really centering those communities' perspectives from the very beginning of the process and not seeing it as kind of something to be tacked on at the end and really thinking about co-creation, accountability, and co-design with, with those communities who um, perhaps have the most to be gained in some cases, but also have stand the most risk of harm. Thanks. Actually, we... we Okay, so it was not cut. So I feel very, very, <laughs> very affected while we are discussing here, and I work for the European Parliament. My only thought is like I see a lot of focus on how digitalization is used for accessing services from the public. But there is other aspects that are important for digitalization, at least from my perspective, is how digitalization help us to provide or to do new things. And I'm thinking just an example, uh, I work on with legal text, uh, and sometimes we have to see how something has been done somewhere else. So for instance, I would love to have artificial intelligence who helps me to say, okay, how this Ishtar particular problem has been solved around the world in all legislations. Something very stupid, but uh, maybe, but I think it would be very useful and it's part of the conversation. So not only public access to public services, but how we do business inside the house. I think that's very important. Uh, we, we go to Jose, Jose, Jose. Well, thank you very much. Just, uh, uh, my name is Jose Renato. I'm from Civil Society in Brazil, from the Laboratory of Public Policy and Internet, and also from the Federal Administration Central Committee on Data Governance, representative of civil society. And just to share a thought on like, uh, how can we even be more productive when, um, when thinking about digitalization, digital transformation of the public sector, and resounding the voices that mentioned communication and feedback also. Be attentive to the feedback of civil society, of people who are using these systems. This is fundamental, otherwise all the work can be counterproductive. And in Brazil, we have many cases that uh, went to the judiciary to question issues related to ethics or to the, um, to the compliance with, for instance, privacy and data protection issues that could have been solved just with a further dialogue with, the, with civil society and specialists. And just to finalize, uh, something that was not touched that much today here is also on the capacity building of the judiciary because judges are the ones that are responsible for when something goes wrong in the administration and policy making, they're the ones that tackle the issue when rights are being uh, Violated. So, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Jose. We have a judge from Tanzania here joining us also, uh, Professor Amal, and then I come to the lady there. Thank you. Uh, I will be very brief. I think uh, many things has been 
have been uh, said. Um, uh, I'm wondering about, uh, my question is why people uh, are scared from digitalization? Uh, and I think uh, we have to think in multi-dimension level. Uh, the first is that l people that have to learn uh, too much new things very quickly and fastly uh, in a global world because when you now, when you have to deal with regulations, you, are, you face a regulation coming from Europe, from United States, from Ch China, from everywhere. So building capacities, I will just think very quickly about complexity and uncertainty. And this makes uh, building capacity something very difficult uh, in this uh, new moving world. Uh, my experience is that uh, in Morocco, uh, which is a part of Africa, we have also to face to the problem of literacy. Uh, civilian uh, will deal with people that cannot read, that cannot, uh, uh, cannot write, etc. So um, something that could be very interesting to, to study and to put in the framework, we don't uh, talk a lot about this, but I think that building capacities is not individual matter, it's collective one. And we should put frameworks that we can bring together uh, techniques and methodology to learn individually and also at the group level. Uh, and AI can bring also tools that are not very well known, but tools based on simulation. We can also study the behaviors of people uh, of collective, in, in collective learning setting. And we can provide uh, new uh, approaches to, uh, to learning because for m most people, digitalization means tracing, means uh, uh, surveillance, means that everybody will know what I am doing, etc. So I think uh, it is very important to demystify what does it mean. Uh, in fact, in, if we, you, if we, have, if we master these tools, we can be a lot less, uh, more comfortable with using them. So uh, just to be very brief, because I don't have time, I know, I, I think that technology is going very fast, regulation is going very slow. And this distortion is putting people in very uncomfortable uh, situation. So there are three things I think very important if I want to summarize. The first is raise awareness and demystify at all levels. The second is lifelong learning. People should learn all the time because the technology is moving. If you remember uh, November 22, um, everybody was surprised by the tsunami of ChatGPT. Even people working in academia and very uh, advanced in research and technology, we were really surprised by this huge uh, tool. And the third thing is adaptation and agility to all these things, regulations. We started with GDPR and now we just, we, we put, uh, uh, we, we developed executive master to learn about governance of AI. Uh, Two years after, we have to change the, 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 the curses because we are not dealing with GDPR anymore. We have to deal with AI Act. AI Act means you have to learn about how to qualify the risk of, of tools. And I, am, I agree with you. If you don't master the technology, you cannot understand what's going on with this regulation. So there are a lot of things to, de to debate, but I know I have to stop. <laughs> So thank you, everyone. Uh, I think just as some very quick concluding uh, remarks, I know there are more people.
We will now explore really proposing a formal dynamic coalition on digital capacity building to the IGF with, with kind of three broad objectives which can be defined with the community. And what we would try to serve is more a secretariat to facilitate that cooperation. First would be a community of practice for knowledge sharing. So what all uh, civil society, academia, governments, private sector experiences that they are having, we can share those around the world as someone also mentioned the experiences in Germany to the experiences in Tanzania are quite similar. And this is a real chance for all of us to learn from each other. Uh, there is also perhaps a need for developing knowledge tools. So this is not only a fora for discussion, but also collaboratively working on some products, uh, which could be, for instance, an assessment methodology uh, for civil servants, which whatever UNESCO will produce is of course available for free for everyone to use, contextualize and so on. But we can collaboratively work on tools which then everyone can take forward. And then also to have a network of experts which can actually support governments, provide technical assistance. And this will, this will be useful to learn from Brazil, to learning from uh, Ghana and facilitating that exchange. Uh, we don't have much more time, but what we will do is follow up with uh, an email and with the formal processes of the IGF and uh, open this up for people to join the coalition and then we will follow up with more discussions. But thank you so much for your insights. It was a pleasure hosting this discussion this morning. Have a wonderful day, thank you.